Good afternoon, I'm Vicki Coffey. I'm the Director of Programs with the Hawk Foundation for Mental Health with UT Austin. And I also represent the uh, Austin Area African American Behavioral Health Network. We're so glad that you joined the Central Texas African American Family Support. Together we will heal forum with us this afternoon. How y'all beautiful ladies and gents doing out there this afternoon? Y'all looking good, looking good. Glad you could join us. Hey, Kanala. So this today is what we're um, just excited that we're continuing our series, the Together We Will Heal series, organized again by the Central Texas African American Family Support Conference. The conference vision, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is to educate the African American community on mental health, substance use, intellectual and developmental disabilities, as just really overall total well being of African Americans. And so through this series, we're hoping that we can continue these conversations throughout the year around these topics and also around the public health challenges that we're facing as, as Black people and as African Americans during this COVID-19 pandemic. So today we hope that this forum will provide you the opportunity just to chat with us, to participate in conversations that offer education, encouragement, as well as resources to su survive these really difficult times that we're all living in. Today's forum is sponsored and we're excited to have Mason and McElveen Family Dentistry. It's located at 7408 Cameron Road. They are sponsoring the event today and they have also provided a $25 gift card that's gonna be raffled off at the end of the forum. So you gotta stay in order to be eligible to win that. And we are really grateful for their sponsorship and we appreciate this kindness. So to, without further ado, we wanna move in today's topic and it is healing generational traumas associated with adultification, a really, really heavy topic that we're going to get into today. And the lovely Miss Jacqueline Miller, who is the founder of Healthy Actions Intervening Responsively, HAIR, has worked with institutions and systems within the violence against women's movement across the nation. With 12, 27 years of experience, Jacqueline has expertise in working at the intersections of gender-based violence and sexual abuse, the child welfare system, youth homelessness, health implications of abuse, as well as reducing intimate partner homicide. So Jacqueline, thank you so much for being here with us today and for just unpacking this very heavy topic with us. A reminder, if you can please mute yourself at all times, unless you are um, asking a question or so forth, but please keep your mute on. And also I know y'all have been on these Zoom calls just a lot lately, but remember, we can see what you're doing, unless you are on your little cute little fake, uh, what do we call it, flat Stanley faces up there. Otherwise, we can see what you're doing, so be mindful of that as well. There's going to be some time for us to just chat and, and interact, and if you can put your question in the chat um, in order to keep the session flowing, we're going to um, just respond to the questions at the end, but you can go ahead as you're thinking of them so you don't forget, put them in the chat, and I'll save those, and we'll share them with Jacqueline to to answer or towards the end of her presentation. Also, just a reminder, this is a very, very heavy topic. Um, and if anything at any point triggers you or, or just causes you um, some certain type of emotions or just to feel overwhelmed, if you want to, at that time, turn off your video so that you are able to uh, address your emotions in private, um, we encourage you to do that as well. And then just to remember to smile and look cute because this is being recorded and it's streaming live on Facebook today. So again, just be mindful of what you're doing on camera. And lastly, again, at the end of the forum, we will be doing the raffle or the donation of the gift card by Mason and McKelvin Family Dentistry that will be uh, raffled off at the end, but you gotta stay until the end. So now, Ms. Jacqueline, take it away, oh, back to you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Vicki. Um, again, I am just excited um, and thrilled to be here. Thank you to all of you who have decided to share your time with us this afternoon. Um, I am so grateful for Integral Care and um, the work that is being done is just so amazing on behalf of communities, um, particularly the African-American community. And so um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of their consistent and ongoing support for our communities and what we need. Um, and so today, as Vicki said, our conversation is centered around 
healing generational trauma associated with adultification. And as has always already been mentioned, um, I've been in the field of violence against women for over the um, 20 years and I've learned so much um, within the movement and how to support survivors of abuse, domestic violence and child sexual abuse. And so a lot of my work um, that stems from, from that movement um, is on the, the emerging topic of adultification, which I've been doing this specific work for over the past five years across the nation. And so one thing that really inspired me to take a look at and begin addressing adultification is how many children who are experiencing violence at home, of um, domestic violence within their families, a lot of those children have taken on and many take on um, adult responsibilities as it relates to responding to violence, as it relates to responding to the safety needs, um, survival needs of those families. So this is something I'm very passionate about. And again, I've been doing across the nation for the past five years. And the last thing I'll say um, is that this is the one thing that I tend to lose a lot of sleep for um, because I, 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 I care about this topic, this emergent topic. I care about the children and the impact that um, like how adults see them, um, what that does in their lives and how um, the implications and consequences that many of those children um, experience because of adult perspectives and how adults see them. So we're gonna delve right in. Um, and so my first thing is that again, back to integral care, I started working with um, integral care as a volunteer on the planning committee for the African American Family Support Conference. And I was just so amazed um, and excited to hear and learn that there was a conference specific for the African American community and address our needs and what those needs look like and what support looked like for us. Um, so I wanted to say that. And so my the first year that I became involved with integral care with the planning committee was in 2019, um, as we were planning for the 2019 conference. And through that process of us meeting um, and, and hearing from the community, I began to learn a lot more about mental health conditions um, and how, and I heard a lot about like the stigma, but working with the with integral care in our committee, many of those stigmas that I, um, had some, had heard about or had some uh, um, awareness of, I began to get more of a comfort level of even talking about this issue and learning that, um, you know, that there are lots of services and resources available for individuals and families who might be experiencing mental, mental um, health disorders and conditions. So with working with the committee, um, again, I begin to learn what are we doing within Texas, Central Texas, specifically to support families who might be having some of these experiences. Um, I entered the poster presentation, poster contest. I wasn't sure what was going to be the results or what that experience would be, but I was like, well, I'm passionate about this topic. Why not go ahead? And so I, am, I was um, amazed and kind of had this shocking moment to learn that I had won the poster um, contest where I once again address adultification of children. And to um, my left is um, a picture of me and some folks that had stopped by to look at the poster and to learn about my work is there. And then on my right, there are some other poster participant, poster contest participants um, that we, where, where we're together as a community. And then the last one on the bottom um, to the left was um, actually this year that we went forth and had our conference. We were celebrating our 20th anniversary um, for the African American Family Support Conference. And so I was, I think one of the most exciting things during the conference is to walk out the room and to see that sign was on my door that the session was full and there was no room for anyone else. And so a lot of times doing these, you never know who's going to show up. You never know um, how the room is going to look and if folks are going to choose you or not. So um, that was such a, an exciting moment for me, like, oh my gosh, the session is full. So I wanted to share that with you all. And I certainly hope you're planning to attend um, next year, 2021. So um, I wanted to start out with some 
I am statements with some affirmations. And I recently learned just how important affirmations are and begin to put in the chat box, what are some affirmations um, that you say to yourself? What are some things you say to yourself when things get challenging or when things, um, when in times like we're living right now where the whole world is changing, what are some of those things you say to yourself? And now I have to also tell you this, I love when the chat box begin to light, light up. I get so much love and energy from that. That, and I know that some great things are being said. So how about take some time now to share with us, what are some of your affirmations? Um, I am enough. I am worthy. I am talented. I am creative. What do you say to yourself? Um, and it's really important the things we say to ourselves and also the stories that we tell ourselves. So go ahead, I'll give you a few minutes, um, seconds to go ahead and share with us in the chat box, what are some of those affirmations that you might use on a daily basis and some of those things you say to yourself? Okay, so please keep them coming. If anything occurs to you um, throughout this presentation and you want to share that I am statement, feel free to do so. So let's take a look at what shapes our experiences. Gender shapes our experiences. Um, in ways, in many ways, and it never operates in isolation. Our race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, and class, many of those things, they work together with gender, which then, once again, tends to shape our experiences. If there is anything you can think of right now that shapes your experiences um, on how you navigate the world, um, how you live your daily life, share that with us in the chat box. Um, for me, being a woman um, shaped my experiences in many ways, but not just being a woman, but being a Black woman shapes my experiences in many ways. So how about share with us, if you if you like to do so, what are some of those things that shapes your experiences? And as we work through these challenges of everyday life, the obstacles created by gender inequity can seem like unsurmountable barriers. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward throughout this presentation that gender tends to shape our experiences and those other things that overlap with gender certainly plays its role as well. So the reality, um, um, well, there's several things as it relates to trauma. We're, go we're looking at three of them today, um, is that acute trauma, this results from a single stressful or dangerous event. Number two, chronic trauma, this results from repeated or prolonged exposure to stressful events. Um, examples include like sexual abuse, child abuse, bullying, domestic violence, um, and those can go on and on, in including like community and neighborhood violence as well. The third thing is complex trauma. This results from exposure to multiple traumatic events. And there are so many that an individual might experience at the same time or might experience like one, once, once one thing is done, then here comes something else. Can anybody relate to that? That once you're out of a crisis, you find yourself back in a crisis, maybe um, child abuse and not only child abuse, but maybe the loss of a loved one, maybe someone got killed. Certainly we live in a time right now that there's so much trauma related to the pandemic Pandemic. So many families have lost numerous of people, um, loved ones and friends and community members. So let's think about that. And then on top of that, in some cases, there are floods or there are um, storms and things like that, which once again can cause huge amounts of loss. Well, for children, children particularly it's a vulnerable population, mainly because their brains are still developing. Um, many children experience a heightened state of stress um, during terrible events and also during major times. A lot of our children right now is really surviving through um, and trying to, trying to survive through um, the uh, current affairs of our nation, the pandemic, uh, being on, in school online. And so we could just go on and on and on with how this might look for children right now. And then the last thing is the ongoing trauma can significantly affect a child's long-term emotional development, their mental health and their physical health and behavior. 
So um, I basically have um, recently, more recently learned about um, Bill Hook's publication, All About Love. And if you don't have it, um, I think it's a, it's a great buy. I think it's so, it's so awesome. So a lot of her writings today, we're going to use it as a curriculum. How about that? Um, so Bill Hook said, since loving is about knowing, we have more meaningful love relationships when we know each other and the time and it takes time to know each other. So when it came to um, preparing to put um, to preparing to have this conversation centered around healing and generational healing, certainly we need to bring in um, the topic of love. And so Bell Hook said that when she was a child, it was clear that life was not worthy living if she did not know love. Um, and she said, I wish I could testify that I came to this awareness because of the love I felt in my life. It was love's absence that let me know how much love mattered. And I thought that was very profound um, as well. And then she also said, I cannot remember when the feeling of being loved left me. I just know that one day I was no longer precious. Wow, let's let that, let that kind of marinate for a little bit. The day that she realized that she was no longer precious. And I began to take that journey through um, her writings just even recently. When was the day or can I pinpoint the day that I learned I was no longer precious or I learned I was no longer seen as a child. I learned that I was no longer handled as a child, okay? And then she also says, those who had initially loved me well turned away. For years, I lived my life suspended, trapped by the past, unable to move into the future. Like every wounded child, I wanted to turn back time and be in that paradise again. In that moment of remembered rapture, where I felt loved, where I felt a sense of belonging. Can any of you relate to that? Do, do, does any of those words resonate with you? Um, and I begin to reflect and go on this journey of reflecting um, as I too am on this journey of healing as well. And I could resonate, and re many of these words resonated with me and I can relate to many of it as well. So what, what she also said is that we can never go back. And that's a key point for today. If you're gonna be taking notes, Make that, make that as a note for yourself. We can never go back. Those experiences that we had, yes, we had them. And I'm gonna ask for you to be kind to yourself during this, this conversation we're gonna have. Give yourself some compassion, show yourself some compassion, and even say as an affirmation, I deserve compassion. We can never go back. Um, but we must go forward in terms of when, it as we're looking at healing and healing the generational trauma that we experience. So many voices that I've heard as I've been doing this work, as I said earlier, across the nation for the past five years, I have been fortunate to hear some of the conversations from um, individuals who shared their adults, particularly who shared their experiences with me. And so I want to go ahead and share with you um, some of those video clips um, with you. I wanna share those with you today. So we're gonna come to our first video. Okay, bear with me a moment here. I'm gonna pull my video up. And please let me know if you can, um, if you can hear them. It's like, I don't care how many times you practice to do this, there's gonna always seems to be a time <laughs> where it's not, you know, um, agreeing or cooperating with you. So let me know, please, if you are able to hear and see the video. I was growing up, I- Yes, you were good. Yes. In the summers, I went Perfect. to work Thank with my you. father who owned his own company and I was yes. expected to work. Um, but I also can look back and say, I think that that helped me become more responsible. So that, so what I'm saying is there, there are certain practices of, of what we would call adultification yeah. that can be very beneficial. How do we, differentiate or, or or i guess is it kind of like a, a spectrum where it's like at some point this combination of, of, of adultification kind of um, 
experiences actually shifts from being positive to negative. Okay, so right there, that was a really short, quick clip. So tell me, share with me in the chat box, what is the main thing that you heard him saying as it relates to, um, as it relates to adultification? What were his experiences that he shared um, related to adultification? So I'm gonna go ahead and get the second video going. Across some very strong Latina candidates, and one that stood out, um, she was amazing. I did the pre screen with her. She was so intelligent, had this passion to go into this industry, and just wanted to take this opportunity. And when we let her know that we couldn't guarantee her placement where she wanted, that she could possibly be placed on the East Coast, the West Coast, Texas. She had to withdraw her candidacy because she couldn't leave her family. She had to be able to take an internship locally that would give her an opportunity to work daytime hours and then be at home to take care of the family, which completely understand. And that's probably the drive that she had to make her a great candidate for this role. And it just made me sad to see that she couldn't continue on. And I just, I really hope that somewhere she was able to, to find that but it, it really it is it's disheartening that she's worked so hard and and can't go take advantage of what's out there so what did you hear what were you hearing from those videos um the first one the guy um and i'm just gonna try and take a peek at the um the chat box, but in our first video, um, he talked about like the privilege. He talked about the privilege of adultification that many, there are many children who actually benefit from adultification as children. Um, and there are several studies, well, that I've come across in particular where um, Caucasian children or children in the general population did have talked about that adultification um, is like a benefit for them because they get to learn about the family business. They get to um, get a snapshot of, of uh, career paths that might be um, a good suit or good fit for them. So, but here's the thing, here's what makes it so different for many other groups um, of children who might not have privilege or who might not have the resources is the key thing is resources. Many of those, um, the children who were Caucasian talked about um, adultification being a benefit. They also talked about support being provided to them from their parents and their families, as well as the resources they were provided. So they were not put in positions and given roles to just do the work, but they were given the resources to support them in doing the work. So that's the key thing I'd like to highlight. And then the second thing from um, the last video is that one of the, um, someone that stopped by, um, by my table during a health fair was talking about a young lady who um, had gone through all the screening processes and was a great candidate to um, for the program that they had. But when she was, she was so focused on where that placement would be because of her role and the responsibilities she had with her family. Although she was going into college, um, it was time to go away for school, but still the family um, expectations and responsibilities was something that was navigating and influencing the decisions that she would make as it related to her family responsibilities and duties. So that told us, that tells us a lot. And there are lots of children who might be living with this, which takes us to like a polling question we're going to have. Most of the adults that I've talked to as it relates to adultification have said at some points of their childhood, they did not feel loved. They felt like they were given responsibilities for the house, for the family, for their siblings, um, that their parents had expectations of them was as a result of not really loving them. So let's go to a poll um, to ask, did you feel love when you were a child? Okay, so we'll give a few seconds for that. Should we relaunch the, um, the poll? 
the first poll question? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and relaunch that. So if you felt love as a child, please indicate you agree, you didn't agree, you disagreed, or you weren't sure. So we see a great majority of people here who answered and participated in the poll say they felt loved as a child. We do have some that disagreed with that, that they did not feel loved. And there have been many times where um, one would answer that they weren't really sure um, if they felt love or not. And sometimes even taking time to reflect, um, taking time to like go back on that journey and to, to think about what were what what are some of the things that were taking place? Who was in my life? What were those relationships like? A lot of times it's not as clear as black and white whether you know I felt loved or not. So thank you for participating in our poll. So the next thing is let's see. Do you all see my screen? Yes, we do. And Jackie, I can help you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I found myself trying to um, see what point we were at with the poll. So I appreciate your support and your help. Um, so to hear our yearnings for love, once again, this piece right here is just as we're going to, as we're taking a look at historical um, and generational healing, let's really just embrace this moment um, as it relates to love, the love we felt, the love we sensed, the love we wanted, the love we thought we had, who we thought we had um, that provided love. So to hear our yearnings for love expressed, many of us turn to popular culture such as movies, music, magazines, books, rather than family. Not everyone can necessarily turn to family um, for those yearnings of love to be fulfilled, as well as not everyone necessarily has family to turn to when it comes to those desires, those human desires that we have for love. So I wanna ask this question, how many of you wrote love poems or love stories during your childhood? I know I did. I did a lot of writing love stories and writing poems about love. How many of you did that? So my next question is, did you continue writing about love? And my goodness, when I thought, when I, I was thinking about this myself, do you know I can't remember when I stopped writing about love? I can't remember um, what experiences was I having as love no longer became like a topic or a conversation? Um, so, and then the third question I'm asking is, if you wrote about love and you're currently over the age of 18 and you still write about love, please say in the chat box, yes, that's me. If you wrote about love in your childhood, you're over 18 and you still write about love, Please share with us if you'd like for us to know who you are. So when we wrote about love during girlhoods, and I'm, I learned so much and um, really um, I'm, I'm gleaning from Bell Hooks in the publication, All About Love, New Visions. Um, and she talks about when we wrote about love during our girlhoods, many of us rare, were rarely taken seriously. I know like for me, it's almost like, okay, yeah, that's puppy love. Okay, yeah, that'll blow over. Okay, yeah, you'll soon be thinking about something else. Like there were times we weren't really taken seriously when it comes to um, love. And so Belle talked about when she was talking to her friends and family about death, that's when she became, they, were, they, take, they took us seriously. But talk about love, eh. but talk about death. Now people are listening, it gets their attention, right? So, and one of the things she talked about, I'll just quickly say this, really interesting to me, and please share your thoughts and what your perspectives are. When men write about love, they tend to write about it from the perspective of having received it and who gives it to them versus women, a lot of times those stories or those publications that we might read where love is being talked about and the author is a woman, a lot of times it's talked about from the place and perspective as needing love 
or wanting love or desiring love. Very rarely is it talk, is, the, is it from the standpoint of having received love and who I have and what I've, uh, what I've been given in terms of love. So I found that to be really interesting. And I think I'm gonna do a little bit more work centered around that. So please share your thoughts on it. So as children grow, they associate love with acts of attention, affection, and care. They see their parents as one satisfying their desires and their needs. Um, many, and they also describe it as a good feeling when you talk to children about love. I know I have, and a lot of them says it's like a good feeling. They've also described it as mommy taking care of them to make sure, um, and she's helping them to do everything right. And then the last one is you, there are many um, have asked children, um, what does it mean to love? Like describe it. And they'll talk about um, hugging someone or kissing them or being sweet and cuddly. So love is a big thing, right? And as it, it's, re it's really a big thing and it plays a key role in terms of healing the generational trauma. Um, and, and many people are talking about it from their childhood. So the importance of definitions. Definitions are vital for starting, starting points for imagination. What we cannot imagine cannot come into being. Definitions let us know where we want to end up at or the idea of love or the idea of success is those definitions. Once again, is those narratives and those stories that we tell our, that are, that we tell ourselves that really help us to give, have a picture of where we desire to end up at. Um, also what's important to chart the journey, create a map. And I'm gonna show you mine in just a moment. We must have a starting place where we know what we mean when we speak of love. So here's what I did. So I did this work myself, actually about maybe just a couple of years ago, I did the work. Um, as I was looking at my work and, and my, my, the lens um, that I'm looking at my work is as a, a black woman um, and a black woman that have experienced trauma and the different various types of trauma that I've experienced. And so I found and wanted the need to take a look at, well, what are the women in my family? What is their traumatic experiences like? So naturally so, I started with my mom. So here's a picture of my grandmother. She, her, her mother died when she was nine years old. So how about share with me in the, the chat box, what do you think my grandmother's experiences may have been or how different they may have been when um, after her mother died when she was nine years old? And so my mother, um, became a parent of four small children between the ages of two days old and four years old when she was five years old. And so then the next thing is my mom have talked a lot and I've shared with my mom, you know, I just appreciate her story. I honor her. I honor her story and I thank her for allowing me to share her story um, with many. So I have her permission to do this. And so that became part of my journey and part of looking at the generational trauma. And so my mom started the kindergarten at the age of nine years old all because she had to stay home and keep the children while my grandmother went to work, um, worked in several jobs to take care of the family. So she started again, kindergarten at the age of nine years old. What type of impact do you think that may have had on my mom starting kindergarten, which is usually like five-year-olds, um, being in a classroom with five-year-olds and she's nine? What do you think? Just share your thoughts with me. And, and then when she turned 12, she began to work in the cotton field. And so today my mom lives with chronic back pain that has been even confirmed. Um, and not that it had to be confirmed medically speaking, but it has been confirmed medically speaking that the back pain that she lives with today is a result of working in the cotton field bent over every day and all day. Also, the sun has a major impact on my mom as well. So once again, let's look at those generational stories. Do we know those stories? Do we know the traumatic experiences that our parents have had enough to give them some compassion and give them some grace and take care of ourselves by giving us some grace and some compassion at the same time. So at the age of 19 years old, my mom was forced to leave the house, which was in, Miss, in the South, in Mississippi, was forced to come North. 
Um, and so that was traumatic. There was very traumatizing as she was put on the bus at the age of 19 and going to a foreign place up north where she really know, knew and didn't know anyone. So she lost those connections. She lost that family um, um, bonding that she was accustomed to. All of that was just ripped apart from her. And so then she got pregnant with me. I'm the oldest. And so here's, here we go. I began to, I was curious about my mom's pregnancy with me. And I asked her, what was your pregnancy experience like with me? Um, and a couple of things that she said was that she cried every day. That then began to give me some idea that that was a stressful time for her of being pregnant, being a, away from home. Um, and so um, the issue of, being accepted or did I do something wrong? Am I gonna have support? How am I gonna take care of this child? And then to go through that, then the next thing she experienced after I was born is that um, at the age of six months old, when I was six months old, um, we became homeless. And that's when I had my first asthma attack. So I began to, once again, I have to, had to, in terms of looking at healing my own trauma, I needed to go back and, ex and understand and learned um, my mom's experiences with trauma as well. It's where when the love really came in is to hear her, hear her story and to understand from her perspective what her experiences were. So generational and individual trauma, um, there are legacies of trauma, racism and prejudice and discrimination has a lot to do with generational and individual trauma, the cumulative exposure to traumatic generations, and then on and on the role that culture plays, family plays, connections, um, how families heal, how families bounce back is certainly critical. Um, the way we experience shame, where it might um, be related to child sexual abuse and what that looks like and how the family responds to that. A lot of families do, does have like history, some histories of child sexual abuse in it. Um, and a lot of those families are ashamed to talk about it. Those are like deep, dark secrets that no one um, even knows about and doesn't even bring it up. So trauma varies, um, the response to trauma varies by individuals as well as their families. It is important important to also consider and include parenting styles. There are parents who set, um, who are reluctant to impose in rules and standards on their children. Many of them had that imposed on them. And the last thing that they wanted to do, and so many talk about this, is imposing that on theirs. They want to have it different. They want their children to have a different experience. And then there's another type of parenting style that emphasizes the positive family interactions and connections. While it's really important to know your own or to know your aunt or to know your cousins. That is a, um, a, for some parenting styles as a focus. Then the other thing is that blind obedience, just do as I say. How many of you can relate to that? Just do as I say and don't question me. And then the last one I have here um, is where parents set high standards for their children um, and they respect their children as independent beings and that they can make their own decisions. And now I've taught you and I've told you and I've given you the skills. Now you need to make some rational decisions. So there are different parenting styles out there and some might be a mixture. Um, so what is adultification? Adultification simply of the de definition that I'm using today is a premature empowerment of a child to assume authority, acquire knowledge and function in roles associated with adulthood. These are some of the age brackets of what, we, uh, what we're seeing and learning about adultification ages, how early it can start in a child's life. Um, here on my screen, it says five years old, but what I've learned recently is that it's even younger than that, especially for black girls. Black girls who are born prematurely and in the NICU unit of hospitals, many of them are adultified. You might say, how is that? Well, where they are not provided the nurturing care time and attention that other babies might be given all because they're seen to be strong and they're seen to be, oh, she's okay. And there have been many nurses that have even admitted to this saying that, well, they just look in on her and see she looks pretty strong and she's breathing. And they might give that caring and nurturing time to another child, um, who, to a non-Black child, um, to be more specific, and certainly to a non-Black um, child who um, is a male. 
And so once again, it takes us back to the gender, that what gender shapes the experiences. And so all of this um, here on the slide, when children are growing and developing, these are many of the things um, that they begin to um, learn about, such as gender stereotyping or getting a peek of that. And I highlighted leadership because I just added this. Studies and research, and we don't really need the studies. We can hear the voices of, of people and individuals and children to learn about this. But the average age of leadership desire for children is eight years old. That's when they begin to start talking about or exhibiting behaviors that are related to leadership. You can look at your child and say, oh, that girl is a leader. <laughs> and so a lot of times it's, it's described as bossy, but no, it's not bossy, it's leadership. So once again, this tells us how early, and we look at these age um, brackets of when adultification occurs. So the historical perspectives, experiences of black children um, during slavery and the cotton field is a narrative that a lot of us have, or the narrative that is very much widespread. Black children were not part of the real fabric of American society. Um, the cultural shifts came as it related to child labor laws, but that was not in Include, they did, that did not include the perspectives or the experiences of Black children. Um, and the perspectives of childhood are generally seen as a protected period of time that is relatively carefree. But do all children get to benefit from that perspective, that this is a carefree time and that you're protected? Tell me in the chat box, do you think all children get to benefit from um, childhood being seen as a protected period of time and relatively carefree? So some of the methods of adultification certainly can be through family traditions or family identity, how that family shapes um, the family structure or the expectations they have of children and other family members. Also denying children childhood humanity. Not all children can play. And certainly I've heard in so many meetings that I've, that I've attended and participated in more recently that white men have talked about when they were children, they had no fear of playing on the street or their parents had fear of them playing in the streets or playing with toy guns in the street. They felt, they said they were never threatened. They never felt threatened to play in the streets with a toy gun um, and that their play was never under surveillance and that their parents, their moms in particular, never had a fear of them being shot down. So also let's look at another method is parents unrecognized traumatic experiences. They may not realize that they even have trauma that they're surviving, enduring and living through and might by default handle their children in such ways that they're not identifying their own traumatic experiences. Um, another method is treating children like an adult or like a friend or like a partner. One lady says, my daughter is like a therapist. She figures everything out. Um, and also the intergenerational methods of adultification and society's perceptions. Um, family stress, parents may rely on their children to function. Many of those parents might rely on their children as translators, um, may rely on their children to work jobs, to contribute to the finances so that the family can survive. There's often an unequal pace of acculturation between parent and children. They don't necessarily um, adjust to a new environment on the same pace at the same time. Also, the loss and lack of social support is key for family stress. Poverty and low wages, hello somebody. And we're living in a, um, a time with a, a pandemic right now that uh, many parents were not essential workers, have become essential workers out of necessity, needs and survival. And then the last thing is where there's a, um, experience in family and neighborhood violence can certainly add to and contribute to family stress. And many families are living in isolation, certainly even more now. And we should be concerned about and think about families that we aren't seeing, that we don't hear from, and we don't have access to. Because if that's the case, let's think about it in terms of the rate and the severity of it now that we're in a pandemic and most of us are um, working from home. So some of the risk factors can be chronic mental or physical illness in one or both parents, which means a child is taking on responsibilities because the absence of parents. Um, incarceration is a big one, divorce in a family where now children take up that, um, that, fam that parent who's no longer there, which then it can become spousification, which is where a child takes on the role of a spouse. 
because of the absence of a spouse, um, a, the death of a parent, a chronically ill sibling. Like in my case, I was sick all of my childhood, which took my mom out of the home a lot from her other three children that she had. And then growing up in foster care, I wish we had time. I can share some of those examples with you of, of children that have aged out of foster care and what they talked about their experiences being um, while they were young and in foster care. So let's look at this image here. This image here are like many institutions that family might find themselves turning to or relying on for help, um, for support or for answers. And so where parents might be out of the home because of this complex, every time I look at this image, it's like a maze to me. Um, and it's like, you can so easily get trapped into this. And like, where is the way out? Those, um, the way out can be so small. And it's, it's like, where are you gonna find that at, right? And so while families or parents um, or maybe out getting the help that uh, that they need, legally speaking. Well, guess what? Those household responsibilities, household duties, duties um, with the children might in fact fall on the children or the shoulders of the older child. So some of the effects can be anxiety, depression, mental illness. Some of the things we're seeing as a result um, of, of adultification in our society are impaired relationships with their peers, that they're, they're former relationships have been so interrupted because they've been isolated or socially isolated due to having to help with the family or the family's needs that they have not been in contact with members of their own peers. Substance use, deterioration in their schoolwork, career problems in maintaining relationships in adulthood. So as a result of all of that, or what I've described um, that many children are living through, it's so important that we understand or we get to at least know that child's perspective by asking or finding out if they perceive their experience to be fair or unfair. Um, and what we found is that children that perceive their responsibility to be unfair, it determines their level of competence. And we're gonna go into what some of those look like right now. Some of those low level emotional competence can be aggressive, aggression, demanding. They might be confrontational. Now, once again, this list is them based on, based on them feeling that their situation or what they're living through or the expectations of them, they feel like it's unfair. And I think that's a really good piece that we can learn how someone might be thriving through what their experiences are. So again, this is a list of those, um, some, some that might feel um, these emotions be out of feeling that their situations are unfair. I've heard from children that say that their parent or their father in particular has other children and is taking care of them and is, um, they live with them and they feel like that's unfair. And so we can have conversations about that and do a little bit more exploring with the child. Now, here's the piece where children or a list where children feel like it's fair. So what we find is when they feel like their situations are fair, um, they have been, they receive report support from their parents. Um, they've also been informed it's short term. Like mom may say, I'm taking a class. It's only eight weeks. This is going to help me make more money. We all are gonna benefit from this. Once I'm done, we all are gonna celebrate. And those children have reported being rewarded for their, uh, for their work or for their contributions versus the, uh, the children who felt like it was unfair were not rewarded and did not get family or parental support as they should have. Okay, and that can be for so many different reasons, maybe the resources like mom doesn't have time or extra time to do extra things and not even realize once again, not even realize a child is feeling that way. So here's a list of those who feel like it's fair, um, assertive and ambitious and drive and strong willed and patient, good listener, detailed, meticulous and neat. Okay, so again, that's the list from those who feel like their situations or what their the expectations on them, they feel like it's fair. So for all of what I just shared, many children feel like all of these things and experiences, and a lot of, a lot of them talked about there are some good times and good experiences. Not everything is all heavy and bad and not everything is all traumatic. Um, but in the middle and in between, there are some things that they do feel like it's, it's pretty cool to have. Um, and so many of them talk about feeling uh, where they may be having all those experiences. I heard a girl say, she was 15. She said, I feel every bit of 51. And it wasn't just because of what was happening at home, but it was also about how society 
um, was, was, was handling her or was um, addressing her, how they were addressing her. Do you, you know the young lady that filmed um, George Floyd as he was um, being murdered in the street? That young lady talked about um, her feelings and talked about her emotions. And she talked about, she wasn't even allowed to cry in public because people then started saying she's fake and phony. She's doing that to get attention. She's doing that to get clout. And once since she was labeled as, um, they said the 17 year old girl, but then another um, media report said the woman who filmed George Floyd. So that shift certainly she talked about is having an impact on her aging process and on her well-being and how she's feeling even as a person in the society. So Nelson Mandela says, one of my favorite quotes, there is no greater revelation about society other than how it treats its children, and how profound and true that is. So now we're going into like the planning piece. There are three principles in place um, to respond effectively to scenarios or situations where we might know children are experiencing adultification or if we experienced adultification in the past. What I looked at in terms of my own life, I saw that it was more society that adultified me, um, how I was handled, how I was treated. Um, even there are reports out right now that shows that black girls are perceived to be less needing of protection, um, nurturing, playtime, that they're perceived to be more knowledgeable about sex and adult topics and conversations than their white counterparts. So that tells us already there are sets of children who will in fact be treated in, as such. And it's like an ongoing thing, like the expectations of black women are cast upon black girls as well. So from the start, not much attention has been given to intersectional vulnerabilities that include race, gender, and class. Many children are pulled off track by life experiences. Um, and not all children are provided with opportunities, tools, and resources to put them back on track and certainly to put them back on track in non-punitive ways or put them back on track in non-criminalized ways. Um, and so these are some essentials for making an effective plan. Check your biases. It is crucial that we check our implicit and explicit biases, that we be non-judgmental, be open-minded, get to know the family and how they function. And this is one simple one. It may be true for your family as well. Cousins grew up like siblings. We're just like brothers and sisters. And my aunts and uncles were just like my mom and my dad. Uh, so also have conversations about their inner strength and what keeps them strong in the times of stress. Respond with encouragement and link parents with resources for stress management. Building re resilience. Resilience has to do with a person's ability to make plans and follow through them or to problem solve or to manage impulses and feelings. But when it comes to trauma, don't be surprised if an individual don't know yet. If you ask them, what do you need? And we should be asking questions, what happened and not what's wrong as when it comes to trauma, but they may not have a plan yet. So let's not be surprised if they can't figure it all out or don't have a plan written down or don't know what the next step is gonna be. Because a lot happens during trauma and a lot of those triggers, a lot of people are triggered right now for what's happening within in our nation. Resilience is not something you have or you don't. It's a human capacity. It can be developed in anyone. So these are some of the wheels or spokes um, that's really critical when it comes to resilience and people can decide for themselves. Many of them really need that strong family support. We know that children thrive with um, a loving parent or with loving adults, uh, with a non-offending parent, with a non-violent parent, they thrive with them and they do well. Also peer support is key. The competence level, self-efficacy, self-esteem, school connectedness. How about now? The children feel like they aren't connected to their school one five-year-old said, this is not real school. And so it's hard for her to really stay engaged because she says, this is not real school. This is the internet. Um, and so also the spiritual belief is really key for many um, families and many people. And we need to honor, value, and respect that. And then uh, what we know about hope and resilience, a lot of adults have felt like within my career time is that once a child is damaged, that they're damaged. And they have had very little belief or faith that they can actually build and be, um, that there's hope in this situation. But what we know is a one half 
to two thirds of children exposed to trauma go on to achieve success and live well-adjusted lives. We also know that the number one factor present amongst those who broke the silence of abuse, cycle of abuse is empathy, developing empathy for self and others. I'm gonna give you two empathy blocking statements is that when a child is crying to ask them, so why are you crying? What are you crying for? There's no reason for you to be crying, stop crying. That's actually an empathy blocker. Another empathy blocker is if someone is telling their story and telling their experience and for someone to respond and say, well, just look at what happened to me. <laughs> you think that's something you should hear my story, honey. Those are empathy blocking statements and we want to avoid empathy blocking statements. It says it, it it's, it's um, like dismisses or diminishes that person's experience um, and the fact that they're even having courage and being maybe, maybe they're being brave at that moment to break their own silence. So it does matter how we respond. Reduce isolation, creates engagement, creative engagement can help to ease social isolation, design systems and activity to bring people into meaningful relationships. And one example is I learned a school um, for their children, they don't just have the online school all day, but they're also having online concerts now or online art shows or art galleries or talent shows online. And maybe that's how we can bring some families into creative engagement. But there's an ongoing process of addressing implicit biases. It's not a one-time deal or one-time shot. I've had the training and I'm good. I know what I know everything now. But it's an ongoing thing as our world is developing more and more and more and becoming new. Well, certainly there's some additional areas we need to learn what our biases are. Okay, I have another video for you and we are just about done. I hope that uh, chat box has been exploding uh, because again, I get so much energy from the chat box. I am going to um, stop sharing this one and I'm gonna bring you into the last video. And then we have two other slides to play. Um, and then we're gonna do some more uh, poll questions. So I'm going to need you all's help to let me know if you can see the video. I am the founder of Healthy Actions yes. Entity Responsibly, known as HAIR. As a result of the coronavirus, new sets of children across this nation will be introduced to adultification. This is when responsibilities that are typically expected of adults fall on the shoulders of children. Many of their parents are essential workers, which means they may be out of the household for extended periods of time. Some of the intersecting topics with adultification are financial struggles, such as poverty, um, domestic violence, homelessness, substance abuse, incarceration, and the list can go on and on. It is our responsibility to interrupt the adultification of children reach out to healthy actions intervening responsibly to learn about the impact, gain some of the tools and the resources on how to interrupt this emergent topic, adultification on behalf of our children. So how about share with, share with us today, um, what, what are some other topics? If you didn't see the one um, you're thinking of in terms of adultification, and what we're experiencing right now in, um, in our nation with the pandemic, just go ahead and put it in a chat box and let us know uh, what you're thinking. For some reason, I'm now can't get my, um, okay. I think I'm there now. And we're gonna do some, po uh oh, I'm sorry, you all, give me a moment on this. <laughs> so let, we wanna hear and learn from you all. What are some, let's do some more poll questions. Um, we want to know what your experiences have been and what your thoughts are. Let's do a few more of poll questions. So this one is, I lived in a household with one of both parents who had a mental illness. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you for participating. We see a great number were unsure if they lived in a household where um, a parent had a mental illness. Uh -oh. Then maybe one more question. Um, I really enjoy my role in the family. So about 40%, 40%, 40 um, like equally agreed and disagree, and then 20% um, were unsure. And as we said earlier, it is really important, you know, to know how people are feeling about their roles in, in their family and what that looks like for them. Um, so now let's go back and do our, the end of um, our final slides. So Bell Hook says critically intervene in a way that challenges and changes. Um, we have lots of opportunities to bring change. So I'll just quickly say um, part of my resilience has come forth and I see it in action and manifesting through art. Um, as I've been one of my family members um, would, during my childhood would destroy all of my art, which really did affect my self-esteem and my self-worth and feeling like I wasn't good enough or anything I did wasn't good enough. And so now I make earrings, my, my art is back and I'm just so excited that I'm being healed and restored. So I have tangible ways to see my healing has really taken place. And then um, my last thing is um, I had the opportunity to work with Empire, the show, over the past six months before the season ended. So that's something I'm really proud about. I love the, the, the design, the stage, the art. It was just absolutely amazing for me. And it was really good for my healing journey that I was on. Um, so quickly, what can what, what is one thing you can do to um, for children of color to access childhood humanity? Um, so what can you have? Can you help a child have a childhood? These are some materials and tools um, I wanted to share. And then lastly, I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, and once I get going, I get going. It's, I'm so passionate about this topic and I love it so much. And it gives me so much joy and enthusiasm. Um, so now I'm closing this part out and handed it over to my team. Thank you so much, Jackie, for your very passion, energy-filled presentation this afternoon. You can tell that this is just your thing. This is what you're into, and it's really nice to, to be a part of a presentation where somebody just lives it. They love it, and thank you for your energy. So we do have a question that came through the chat earlier, and that question was, to do would you consider sex trafficking adultification? Absolutely. Um, I, well, you know, actually there are individuals, adults particularly that uh, misuse and exploit children with a complete understanding of what they're doing. Like they know it's a child and not necessarily that they see that child as an adult. So that wouldn't be an excuse at all. Okay, thank you. And, then, and I guess we wanna open the floor if there are any other questions at this time. Yes. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask those questions. And we know some people may have to bounce off the call. We're running a little bit over, but we appreciate you guys for staying with us. Any questions, anybody? Okay, so I guess at this point, we'll go ahead and end again. Thank you so much, Jackie, for just sharing with us this afternoon on this very serious, serious, heavy topic. Um, again, your passion and energy is just amazing. And we hope to connect with you again in the future. We oh, also want, I'm sorry. There is a question. How is the COVID-19 making adultification okay. worse? Oh, great question. So uh, COVID-19 is making adultification worse because many of those parents 
are out of the household as essential workers and out of the house for extended periods, periods of time for the sake of a survival. A lot of families have lost jobs and lost, um, lost income as a result of the COVID-19. And so a lot of families are really trying to play catch up and make up as a result of COVID-19. And then also what children are home, like families are home, um, it, put, it can put children in more of a position of adultification because those children are home, whereas they would be, there are hours that they would be in school. But now that they're home, there's, they could be under more, um, um, uh, more under the spotlight in terms of having them to do certain things including going outside the house to do things and to run errands. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so other questions? Felt, seemed like I heard somebody trying to ask. So we're gonna go ahead and do the raffle right quick, Lady Jane. There are a few participants left on the call still, quite a few. So we'll see who is gonna be the fortunate person to win that. And again, you have to be present to win. So we'll see. And you have to have your screen on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I added that. <laughs> we just wanted to see y'all. <laughs> see who we get. Did we lose Vicky? Uh oh, we may have. Okay. Oh, hi, everyone. So, Miss Betty Baldwin won today's raffle, and she has won a $25 gift card uh, that was uh, donated to us by the Mason and McKelvey Family Dentistry. We do appreciate your support. All right, Vicky is coming back in. Well, <laughs> that is virtual for you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. We certainly appreciate your support throughout this time. Do know that the 2021 conference is virtual and it is going to be from the 3rd to the 5th of February, 2021. The youth conference, we do have a youth conference and it is known as the Yes to Best Comes a Summit. It is for the youth from ages 14 to 24, and that will be on February 6, 2021. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you all next month at 1.30 p.m. on the third Wednesday. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for educating us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.